Welcome everyone to the second episode of the first season of the Wandering Thoughts podcast. I am your host, Joseph Salmieta Jr. And today we're just going over a couple things that are on my mind. It's you know, it's, it's been a week since the other the first episode, technically. You know, it's been interesting to see the reactions to the first episode of the podcast. I've been keeping tabs on what's going on on YouTube and then what's going on on, on Spotify, and whatnot. They're already over over thirty plays. 30 downloads on Spotify and whatnot. Well, Spotify was just like the two episodes, which is great. I'm thrilled. I thought I was going to get like five or something. Uh, the feedback's been great, too. I had one of my friends tell me uh, my voice is kind of enticing, which is weird to hear because I am i can't hear my voice. I love my voice. I've always loved my voice. I've always wanted to do something with my voice. It's just more of a matter of, oh, yeah, five people are telling me I've got a great voice. So I hope to put it to good use with this podcast. I hope to enlighten people and then find a way to have open dialogue with people. Um, there are a lot of topics that I'm really passionate about and really wish I could expound upon, but I'm not an expert. I'm far from being an expert, you know? It could be something that could go somewhere, is what I'm trying to say. It's like, I'm not an expert. I know that. I'm not trained in any field. Like, I know the the first episode of this this podcast was on depression and, and slightly so suicide in the Western world. I know I covered that a bit, and I was very general with the stuff I was talking about. I was like, just listing things that are, I think are causes of issues in the world. So I figure, you know, why not? Why not just go with explaining those points? And the reason why I'm hesitant to do that is because, first off, I'm not an expert. Second, I don't want to be repetitive and be discussing the same old, same old. So I had, what, five points last time? And then I remembered a few others that might be a contributing factor. So let's, let's just cover the first contributing factors then. Let's go. Uh, so we have quick list. We have uh, social media. We have lack of communication with people, like in depth. You, me, another person. We're all getting together. We're having fun. And we're having deep, meaningful connections. Um, so social media, people. Lack of physical activity, lack of activities that bring meaning to life. We have uh, poor food, just a straight up wheat, crappy food. Lack of sunlight, uh, which is shown to be a major, major contributor to fighting uh, depression and staving off depression in the first place. And then we have uh, another one I thought of was um, pornography, which uh, which the, the jury is out on that one still. We've got uh, people like the author of the... Uh, your brain on porn book, who's like, hey, look, there are thousands upon thousands of people online all saying, hey, this is what happens when we get addicted to porn and try to get off porn and how we feel and how we feel once we're out of porn. And you got people who are like, no, it doesn't cause a problem for people. And then they say the only people who have a problem, who feel guilty or depressed or anxious after watching porn and or trying to stay off porn are people like conservatives and Christians, you know, religious people. Which, let's be honest, that makes 110%. Let's just cover that right there. Base right there. Why wouldn't Christians and religious people and and conservatives have a problem with watching people literally have sex with each other? Why wouldn't that be a problem? If you have morals, then something you do that goes against your morals is going to be a problem. Yes, yes, okay, moving on. So it means there is a problem. Whether it affects... Uh, leftists, not all leftists, of course, whether it affects atheists, um, not all la- atheists, of course, or not, is not the point. The point is, it does affect people, and it's a problem, and it needs to be taken care of. So that's another contributing factor to to depression, especially in Western worlds and other cultivated uh, first world countries. Legitimately, it causes a slew of problems. Uh, uh, Withdrawal from porn has been uh, reported to have anything from severe depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, to um, having no sexual drive for three to six months. Like, those aren't things that just have no basis, right? It's, it's reported across hundreds of people. And what's sad is the amount of people who watch it now. I think the... Uh, as of as of two thousand 
I don't want to say 2007, but I also don't want to say 2017. As of the 2000s, late, mid to late 2000, I can't say mid to late because mid is like, what, 2050? Yeah, so let's just say early 2000s through somewhere between 2007 and 2017. I will get more specific dates next time. I will promise the dates. Um, I'm not going on a date. That's not happening. No way am I going on a date. I promise the dates. That makes it sound like I'm promising the dates something. I don't even have a date lined up. Why would I? Anyway... So as of that time, I think it was about 100% of Australian boys had seen porn by the time they were 14, was it? I don't want to get these facts wrong. And girls, well, girls, oh, let's just straight up think about this. Girls don't have the same lust drive for watching porn as guys do. And I know a lot of feminists are immediately going to get mad at this. But unfortunately, no, fortunately, it's true. Why is it fortunate? You don't need to be watching that crap. If you want to watch somebody have sex, film you and your partner doing it. If you want to have sex, go do it. And I don't advocate for sex outside of marriage. It brings too many diseases and problems along with it. Uh, Like a kid, even if you use protection, a kid. Not to mention protection can cause a whole slew of health issues. And I mean on the girl side, a guy just has to wear a condom. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Porn on the rise among teens. Researchers find link with mental health problems. This is an article from 2017. Um, most Australian teenagers are viewing porn and doing so at a younger age than ever before, according to new research. All the young men in our study said they'd seen pornography, and so did the majority of women, Dr. Lin. This is a quote from Dr. Lin. Um, more than 940 young people found the typical age for boys to view porn was for the first time was ages 13 and 16 for girls. Around 80% of young men said they watched weekly, and among the women who watched pornography, nearly two-thirds viewed at least monthly. Now, I just want to stop right there. Think about that. Right off the bat, we're seeing there's a discrepancy between men and women. Boys are watching it sooner. Sex drive anyone. Building testosterone anyone. Learning what sex is anyone. And they watch it more frequently. They watched weekly. Whereas women are watching monthly. And it's two-thirds. What is two-thirds? We don't have a number. Two-thirds of 100? 75%? Who knows? But it seems like it's less than 80%. Which is... Not, I'm not saying girls should not have someone to talk to about this and they should. It's not an issue. It's definitely an issue. What I am saying is it affects guys disproportionately compared to females. Now, if we were to jump into the softcore world of porn, like books, then we would find that it's disproportionately affecting girls. Why? Because guys prefer to see it, and girls tend to, not always, read it or hear it. Not always. Once again, I'm not going to use ultimates here, like absolutes. Uh, let's see what else this says. Uh, researchers identified a link between pornography use and mental health problems and becoming sexually active at a younger age. Well, I mean, okay, if you're watching pornography, you're watching two people have sex with each other, why wouldn't you want to try it yourself sooner? If, 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 pornography is designed to stimulate the body and make you feel pleasure, whether it's through an orgasm or through masturbation, right? That's what it's designed to do, give you pleasure. Eventually, that's not going to be enough, whether it takes six months or two years or three years. It's not going to be enough to just watch it and, and, and do stuff with yourself. Eventually, you're going to need a partner or have a desire, an intense desire to have a partner to do it with. Whether it's some random cute girl in your school, some random cute girl walking down the street. And let's just all talk about the problem there. You start objectifying women if you're a guy. You're like, oh, she's cute. Nice legs. You're not thinking, wow, what a wonderful looking woman. I wonder what she's like. I wonder what her, what her thoughts are and stuff like that. You see a, a, a nice looking guy, you're like, damn, he looks hot. I wonder what he does for his workout routine. I wonder what he does to keep himself in shape. I wonder what he does in his life. I wonder what he does for a job. You don't think that when you look at a woman... And you're watching porn. I'm calling you out, guys. Objectif objectifying woman is not a good thing. I know because I've done it and still do it. That's what happens when you watch porn. Uh, let's see what else this article says. 
we're we're not out to prove that watching porn is a bad thing, but definitely watching pornography more frequently is associated with some negative outcomes such as poor mental health that we can't say from the study if one is causing the other. There are several other studies that have shown that guys who watch porn have higher rates of depression and anxiety, and it tends to go away, not always, but it tends to go away as they step away from it, six months, eight months, a year, two years. It depends on the person. Uh, she, she said appropriate sex education need to be implemented in high school, if not earlier. I'm not sure what you're planning on getting from sex education here. Like, just straight up. What's it going to do? It's going to teach you what sex is. It's going to make you want to have sex. Not be like, oh, well, if you have sex, you're going to have kids. Oh, 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 that's a terrible thing. But use protection. You just gave your kids a way to get around it. I don't think sex education is very viable when it comes to stopping kids from going to the parking lot and doing it. All right, here's what they found. Frequent users of pornography are more likely to be male and well-educated. The average age of first exposure in pornography is declining. The median age of first viewing is 13 for boys and 16 for girls. That's the median age, the average. A lot of guys in the United States tend to do it around 11, which is terrifying. I know several guys who have done it at 9. Like, what 9-year-old needs to be exposed to this? It's rated adult content for a reason, right? Uh, Richards also found young people who did not identify as heterosexual often felt excluded from sexual edu- education at school, which is often, often focused on heterosexual behavior. Okay. Yes, it is. Because if you're a guy with a guy, you can't impregnate him. You can get diseases. Yes, so that should definitely be brought up. If you're a girl with a girl, I don't even know if you can get diseases. I haven't, I haven't looked into that. But you can't impregnate the girl. It's... So when it comes to staving off things like diseases and impregnation then yes, there should be more coverage. And I'm not saying they should be excluded at all. I'm just saying it makes sense that they wouldn't be as high on the target list for this as heterosexual people or, you know, a straight white guy and a straight girl. Why did I say white guy? The culture is getting to me. A straight guy and a straight girl. Oh, gosh. Let's see. That study was based on an online survey of 941 participants recruited via social media in 2015 and published in the Australian New Zealand Zealand Journal of Public Health. Okay, well, that's that's one thing. Now, let's see. uh, Let's see. ResearchGate. All right, Australia. Remember, we're covering Australia here. All right. Youth in Australia routinely exposed to sexually explicit images among 16, 17-year-olds, three-quarters of boys, and one-tenth of girls. That is a huge difference. Out of 100%, three-quarters, this is 75%. One-tenth? Come on, brain, work. What is one-tenth of 100? Uh, 10, right? That's 10? That seems... Um, Three-quarters of 16, 17 year old boys have been exposed accidentally to pornograph web, pornogra- pornographic websites, while 38% of boys and 2% of girls have de- deliberately accessed them. Look at that. That's a huge difference. 38% to 2% of girls. What's what? 2 times 20? No. That's dumb. 2 times 18. Right? Right? No. If you do 2 times 18, that's that's 36. Can't be 36. Eight, eight, 2 times 86, yeah. 14? 2 times 4? It's got to be 14, right? 2 times 20 is 40. 2 times 18 has got to be 14. 2 times 4. I can't believe I'm doing all this math. My gosh. 2 times 4 is 8. The eight ca- okay, yeah, it's 28. How do you get 38? How do you get 38? 19? Why did I forget that 19 is a number? Why am I stuck on the even numbers? Good freaking grief. Okay, 19 times the number of girls is the number of guys who watch porn deliberately. That's freaking insane. Think about that. If this isn't an issue we need to be looking into, then I don't know what is. First, males are more likely to seek out and are more frequent consumers of both X-rated movies and pornographic websites. Second, internet users of any age find it difficult to avoid unwanted encounters with sexually explicit materials. 
you go to your favorite website to watch a movie so you don't have to pay for Netflix, and what do you get? There's an ad on the side with a half-naked woman. How are you going to avoid that? Ad blockers aren't perfect. Let's see what um let's see what the rest of this has to say. I'm I'm going through ResearchGate, which is amazing, by the way. Research great research gate makes it awesome. I'm not even trying to do an ad for them. Okay, research gate, screw you. Uh let's see, the effects of pornography on children and oh this is by the Australian government. Do we work? Okay. Let's let's go. The effects uh oh, yeah, it worked. Uh, the effects of pornography on children and young people. Uh, Antonia Quadra, Elisa Elmir, and Joe Latham. Research summary to December, December 2017. Uh, let's see what it says here. There is a lot of discussion about the possible effects of online pornography on children and young people and the messages pornography generates about gender equality and sexuality. That's a whole ball game right there. The Australian Institute of Family Studies, APHIS, was engaged by the Department of Social Services to review what the available research evidence tells us about the issue. Key messages. Pornography exists within a broader sociocultural context in which stereotypes about gender, sexism, sexual objectification, and violent supportive attitudes are also at play. I completely forgot that pornography is really, really violent. They get slapped, they get pounded, you know, whatever. They get, they get beat up physically. And that's become a normal part of pornography. And then young men, and sometimes young women, go into the field like, well, sex has to be violent. If I'm not feeling pain when he is doing whatever, when he, if he's not slapping me, then it's not real, then it's not real sex. There's something wrong. That's not true. Sex isn't supposed to be painful. The only thing I know that's got to be at least mildly painful is working out. And that's because you're destroying your muscles and rebuilding them. And even then, you have to be careful because if you're too, if you're having the wrong type of pain, you're in trouble. Let's see what else. Nearly half of children between the ages of nine and sixteen experience regular exposure to regular exposure to sexual images. That's terrifying. And this is just Australia, by the way. This isn't the world as a whole, or the United States, which has even freer access to this kind of stuff. Young males are more likely than females to deliberately seek out pornography and to do so frequently. Well, we've covered that. That's something that I have noticed as well, can shape sexual practices in an associate in associate with unsafe sexual practices such as not using condoms and unsafe anal and vaginal sex. Oops, I said the words. Point being, it's not safe if you're watching porn and using that as your guidelines for how to have sex. Uh, may strengthen attitudes supportive of sexual violence and violence against women? It does. There's no may about it, it does. The best approach for parents, caregivers, and teachers responding to children's exposure to pornography is to encourage open communication, discussion, and critical thinking on the part of the children while educating themselves about the internet and social media. Ha! Critical thinking? We're told to not think and just obey the government. Why are we telling them to have critical thinking? Get your head out of the gutter, Mr. Government officials, and do it right. Think about it. Have You either will have critical thinking or you will not. Just straight up. Online technologies, platforms, and practices in general, and more specifically how children and young people interact with the online environment. Uh, being online and connected in a, is a fundamental part of children and young people's everyday lives and relationships. Fundamental, but not healthy. Moving on. The range of online risks uh, children and young people experience. For example, the dynamics and prevalence of cyberbullying, sexting, exploiting, exploitive relationships and connections online. Yeah, that is a major problem. I wonder if that's risen since the since uh, porn became a thing. Not, not just like uh, you you went and looked at Playboy in the 50s, like m- my dad did and, and whatnot. Like who, what dad didn't, right? No, 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 no. Porn on the internet. I wonder if since that became a thing, if the, not just sexual exploitation, but the violence has risen towards Woman, or maybe not necessarily just towards women, but unsafe sex practices as a whole? That's a good question. I'll have to figure that out. Uh, okay, exposure to pornography. In Australia, just under f- half, 44% of, the chil- 44% of children aged 9 to 16 surveyed had encountered sexual images in the last month. And that's surveyed, by the way. So I can't tell you how accurate that is. Think about it. What are the odds all the kids answered 
truthfully. If they said yes, odds are they answered truthfully. If they said no, I'd wonder if they're lying because maybe their parent is right there. Or if it's fully anonymous and they feel safe answering these questions, uh, maybe it's, I think it's more accurate than what it would seem, but I'm, I'm wondering if the number is higher solely because kids tend to lie when they're afraid something's going to happen. Of the 16% had seen images of someone having sex and 17% of someone's genitals. Well, that's not terrifying at all. And that's just images. That's not uh, uh, videos. Younger children, those aged 9 to, tw- and t- 9 to 12, are particularly likely to be distressed or upset by pornography. Yes, they are. For starters, they haven't really fully developed, uh, started to develop sexual tendencies. They're still developing. They haven't really hit their teen years. Most kids don't develop uh, the sexual organs to the point where you can have intercourse and the desire to to do sex until they're about 13, right? It's really prevalent in young guys. It's ridiculous. You, pff, guys get really horny, man. It's disgusting. But yeah, if you're nine years old and you watch two people doing it, especially if it's violent, I would be distressed too. I would be 100% distressed. And if my kid came to me after seeing that, I would be, my heart would be ripped out if I saw that happen to them. If I, it, it would, I would be so devastated for them to have to see something like that. They're nine years old. Their world should be, I'm playing outside, I'm learning and discovering, I have friends, and I'm, I'm drinking chocolate milk. It should not be, Mommy, Daddy, I just saw this, fill in the blank, on the internet, help! That's terrifying. Like, I don't want my kid or even my younger siblings to go through something like that. All right, let's see what else I have to say. Parents tend to overestimate exposure to pornography for younger children and underestimate the extent of exposure for older children. It should be vice versa, man. It makes sense that they would, because you're more concerned with your younger child. What are they going to see? How are they going to get to it? How can we protect them? But if you're dealing with an older kid, you're like, oh, they've got responsibility. They know how to have practice safe internet use. No, they don't. No, they don't. In fact, they know how to get around every single firewall you're going to possibly throw up to stop them. The extent and frequency of viewing pornography differs by gender, with males more likely to deliberately seek out pornography and blah, blah, blah. Yes, we know. We covered this. Uh, with females having more negative views and responses to the exposures of pornography, such as shock or distress compared to males, particularly in older teens, who are more likely to experience pornography as amusing, arousing, or exciting. Once again, it ties into how the, bi- uh, the biology of a male is, and that is men are driven by lust for the most part, and especially by sight. So watching somebody do it, it just hits all the right neurons. Not all guys. I know I know one guy who's never seen it and doesn't want to see it. It's one guy out of every other single guy I know. So one out of 30? One out of 40? Yeah, it's... it's. I am in the United States. I'm not in Australia. Still, the effects of exposure... Oh, no. Oh, no, this is disgusting. I'm not reading this. Ugh. I don't even know what that word means. The use of pornography by adolescents is associated with strong, permissive sexual attitudes, e.g., I guess that's an example, premarital sex, casual sex, etc. There is some evidence that exposure to pornography can increase the likelihood of earlier first-time sexual experience, particularly for those adolescents who consume pornography more frequently. Once again, that ties into what I said earlier, where I said, if you watch porn, why wouldn't you want to go try to do it with somebody? Uh, they can influence a per- young person's expectations about sex, especially young for what young men expect their partners to do and vice versa. Oh, gosh. Yeah, well, let's think about that. Let's dissect that for a minute. The only exposure you've had to people doing sex is people doing sex in a way that will keep people entertained, right? So why wouldn't you expect that to be what happens when you go with a girl or what you would expect to get from that girl in the first place? You didn't go watch your parents do it, and I sure as hell hope you definitely didn't watch your parents do it. Point being, pornography is teaching our kids, and even some young adults, this is how you have sex, and if it doesn't go like this, you're doing something wrong. Uh, Sexual uncertainty because gaps between expectations and reality, yeah. Sexual beliefs and values may also be related to sexual dissatisfaction, anxiety, and fear. Sexual dissatisfaction, I think, should be always should be confined to as an issue to married couples and not teenagers who are who are horny as hell and doing it with each other. Though that is sad that they would have sexual dissatisfaction for the first time. 
because they have such and my immediate thought is they have such a high expectation expectation based on what they see in porn. The girl's supposed to sound like this and, and go like this and, and, and make these noises and do these moves. And if she doesn't do those moves, then I failed as a guy. And the girl's like, well, if my guy doesn't do this, this, and this, then he failed as a guy or I failed as a girl. And and then they're both feeling bad about their sexual experience and then doesn't get talked about. Oh, my word. Adolescent pornography use is associated with stronger beliefs and gender stereotypes, particularly for males. Oh, uh, Oh, my word. Okay. Male adolescents who view pornography frequently are more likely to view women as sex objects and to hold sexist attitudes such as women leading men on. Uh, I don't know if I'd call that sexist. That last part, leading men on. Uh, I am a guy, so I guess my word doesn't count. But it does definitely, 110%, cause uh, guys to view women as sex objects because that's how they're being raised to view them. And before you give me the, well, they should have better responsibility for what they're watching on the internet. Let me give you two things here. One, biology. It's addictive. Pornography is addictive. If you watch it more than once, odds are you're going to be addicted to this stuff. Second, we're living in a culture where women are walking around half naked on the television all the time and telling everyone, it's okay if I post nude selfies of myself on Instagram because guess what? It's body positivity. That's not going to help people, guys and girls, to not objectify women if all you're doing is posting half-nude selfies of yourself. TikTok is filled with thirst traps, man. I got off TikTok for that very reason. I don't need to see that. If I want to see thirst traps, I'm going to go on some porn site, right? Not, I don't want to see it on TikTok. A kid's app, no less. Nine-year-old kids are on there and say they're scrolling through. They're going to see that. That's really sad to me. Adolescents who consumed violent pornography were six times more likely to be sexually aggressive compared to those who viewed non-violent pornography or no pornography. No, duh. I, re- I said this already, right? You're going to be more violent if what you're consuming is violent and that's what's teaching you how to do it. Now that seems like I'm making an argument for why video games are bad. But if you're playing a gun video game, yeah, heck yeah, it's going to be violent. If you if you have a gun and you're defending yourself and somebody's coming at you, yeah, it's going to be violent. I don't think video games teach kids to go be violent on purpose. That's a whole other topic, though. Porn is a different story. Sexual preoccupation, compulsive con- consumption, and addiction. Addiction, that's what they, they said in the article can be associated with the frequency of viewing pornography and also the purposes of using pornography as a way of relieving negative states. Yes, it does. That's part of the reason why depression depression and anxiety is often associated with people who watch pornography is because they turn to it as a way to get away from their daily ba- their daily life, an issue they're having, maybe their wife, their sister, their brother, uh, their job, and they turn to it for relief. And then I, I've done it myself. Turn to it for relief. I have clarity of mind for 10, 20, 30 minutes afterwards. I've got a game plan going on how I'm never going to watch it again. An hour or two hours later, I'm feeling really low. I'm not even feeling low about watching it. I'm just feeling low in general. Like, like my mood has dipped below where it should be. Oh, gosh. Pornography is such an evil thing. I wish people would do something about it. But the, you know what? At the same time, I don't. I think it comes down to personal responsibility. Some regulation, I think, is, is necessary. Only to keep it out of the out of the reach of adolescence. Because that is illegal. But we can't regulate a free market. And I know there's a lot of problems with the porn industry. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but I do know that there should be a way to stop that. Um, I know the porn also helps, greatly helps uh, influence the uh, uh, the sex trade, uh, sex trafficking. I know that's an issue. Uh, keep that in mind the next time you watch porn. Why don't you? Um, and it was, and it was not, there's a lot of arguments about the fact that porn is good for you. It helps you feel good. It helps relieve sexual tension. Um, it helps you to be better in the room. I've heard that argument. It helps you to be better when you're with your partner. Which, by the way, this, this article on the study shows that that's not true. Instead, it means both couples are going to be dissatisfied. Let's see. Well, some of the effects of viewing pornography, such as permissive be- attitudes and beliefs about sex, knowledge about sexual practice, and sexual practices themselves may not be inherently problematic, the most dominant and popular and accessible pornography contains messages and behaviors about sex, gender, power, and pleasure that are deeply problematic. In particular, the physical aggression, slapping, choking, gagging, hair pulling. Yes, all of that is in porn. If you haven't seen it, don't go watch it. 
and verbal aggression is just a name calling. This is predominantly done by men to their female partners. Yeah, and it's not like the men, odds are the men aren't enjoying it themselves. I don't know a single guy who'd enjoy humiliating a woman like that. Unless they've been watching porn cons- for a regular basis. How do we respond to this? Let's see what this article says. Uh, may cause children and young- exposure may cause children and young people to develop sexual lit literacies to previous generations. What the heck is that supposed to mean? To reduce the Australian government and non-government services have taken steps to reduce children and young people's exposure to online risks, including pornography, and enact harm minimization strategies. Three key types of interve- interventions have been identified, and I'm going to switch over to the United States uh, after this. Legal and regulatory avenues to exist to existing legislation regarding online pornography and online behavior, such as sexting and sharing of explicit images. Two, a education for children and young people, critical media and digital literacy, respect for relationships, sexuality, and sexual health. And three, education and resources for teachers and parents about how they can support safe relationships for children and young people both online and in real life. And then to give some advice to parents, caregivers, and teachers. Uh, Open communication, uh, critical thinking. Young people should be encouraged to question pornography, asking, seeing porn might seem normal, but what does porn say? Who makes it and why? And what does it mean? What does it all mean for you? Okay. You should be asking these questions about everything that's in your life. The food you eat, the stuff you watch, the people you talk to, the friends you have, uh, the government who's over you. Not just about porn. Don't accept what the government says to you and just roll with it. Get over yourself and think critically about everything in your life and not just pornography. Come on, man. Young people are not just passive consumers of pornography. Critical thinking helps viewers to reflect on the messages contained in online pornography and fosters discussion or respect of the agency of the young people involved. What, what do you mean agency? Like the people themselves? Like who they are, what they are, what they believe? Arming children and young people with tools to engage critically with media is important to their understanding of the differences between online pornography and their offline sexual relationships. Children should not be having offline sexual relationships. So if by arming you mean, hey kid, this is not, you're not allowed to do this, you shouldn't be doing this, you're 13 freaking years old, then heck yeah man, let's do it, let's get these, let's get these resources into the hands of these kids and make it a topic that's not taboo to talk about. Because I know I was terrified to talk about my, my porn issues until I was about 15 years old. And now I'm the most open guy about it ever. Because I know other guys struggle with it. And if I don't start the conversation, who will? You know, who's, who's going to start it? Uh, Digital literacy. What? Meditation? Meditation. Parental controls are essential to harm minimization strategies. The, also, the Office of E-Safety Commissioner, as of 2016... Cautions parents and caregivers, you can teach your child strategies about how to deal with offensive material, but be vigilant, especially if your child is prone to taking risks or is emotionally or psychologically vulnerable. Well, that's helpful. Thanks, Mr. E-Safety Commissioner. Are you a she? Thanks, E-Safety Commissioner. That was very useful. You just told us what we already know. You need to teach your child strategies. Teach them how to deal with it. But let me not give you an example on how to deal with it. Very useful. Um, exposed all information is extremely important to their ability to process their experience in healthy ways. In what can I do if my child sees content that's offensive? Well, that's very vague. What if they saw somebody calling somebody a cracker? And they got offended by that. Or they saw somebody reading the U.S. Constitution and they got offended by that. Are you going to use these same things to help them? That's dumb, man. I mean, sure, if a kid's upset, you should talk them through it. But don't affirm they're upset. Especially if they're upset over something as petty as reading the U.S. Constitution. Encourage your child to talk if they've had something on they, they've seen something online that has upset them. Let them know that if they report viewing inappropriate content, they won't be punished or have their access to the internet taken away. They should if they continue to view it afterwards. Educate them so that if they're sent something inappropriate online, they know not to respond. They should know anyway. But, uh, guess what? Sexual desire overrules all logic. Uh, let's see, uh, back to digital literacy. Parents and caregivers are encouraged to educate themselves about the internet and social media in order to be aware of their current online dangers and opportunities facing their children. Parents and caregivers are less likely to be in- intimidated by online risk if they're informed and take an active role in their children's digital lives. That's not helpful, man. That's not, 
It's helpful that you're given these information, but it's terrifying information with very little active help. Uh, let's go to this ResearchGate article real fast about the Australian uh, porn issues. 17 pages long by Michael Flood, Queensland University of Technology. It has, uh, was it, it's 84? Yeah, 84 publications, 2,579 citations. This guy does, anyway. The paper has 110 citations and has been read 3,941 times. I think that that makes this paper credible based on the scientific research and how that all works and how scientific papers work. Abstract. Youth in Australia are routinely exposed to sexually explicit images among 16, 7 year olds, three-quarters of boys. We read this page. We read this. Uh, yes. Okay. Children's and young people's exposure to sexually explicit materials is only one of a number of issues relating to children and sexuality that have been the subject of public controversy and policy. Cultural anxieties have been articulated in recent decades about pre teenage sex, homosexuality, teenage pregnancy, child abuse, child pornography, and sexualized products for preteen girls. I didn't know that last one was a thing. And I know a lot about the porn industry. Well, not the we're inner workings of the porn industry. I'll clarify that. I wish I did, so I could be disgusted and make my voice heard. Moral panics about uh, young people's sexual activities fa- fail to acknowledge that most young people move into adulthood as healthy and responsible sexual beings. No, they don't. No, no, they don't. If by healthy and sexually mean they f- they go and have sex with any single person that they want to have sex with, and they don't get married. Then sure, by all means, they're definitely healthy with their sexual habits. Sex among Australia's youths, like sex among, like sex among its adults, is off, is too often neither gender egalitarian nor pleasurable nor safe. Okay, public concerns about young people's exposure to pornography have been prompted in part by six shifts in young people's sexual lives over the last few decades. First, children are now starting puberty, puberty and adolescence earlier and staying in it for longer than ever before. Ah, oh, so that has been confirmed. Second, the average age of first intercourse has declined. Uh, third, younger people engage in a wider variety of sexual behaviors than older people, including oral and anal intercourse. That's nasty. Uh, fourth, young people now have a greater number of sexual partners and over a lifetime will substantially greater number of partners than their parents did. The world we live in says that's not an issue. It is an issue. Fifth, some young people are participating in an increasingly visible gay and lesbian community. And about 1 in 10 secondary school students is sexually attracted either to the same sex only or to both sexes. I guess that issue ties more with uh, not knowing what to do about it. Because as we pointed out earlier, sexual education tends to focus on heterosexual people. Finally, today's children are growing up in a sexualized cultural environment. Late 20th century Western culture saw a proliferation of sexual imagery and an explosion of popular sexual debate. While sexual speech and behavior have long been around for children to witness, children now have a hypermediated environment in which pictures and words have unprecedented cultural influence. Yeah. Yeah, think. Actually, movies and adult websites are hardly the only sources of young people's encounters with sexually ex- explicit represent- representations. There is increased testing and blurring of boundaries between pornography and mainstream media and art and ad- adoption of the language and visual codes of pornography and endless sex talk in popular culture. Yeah, it is. It's terrifying to me that you turn on a movie. It's a great movie. It's awesome. And they're having sex in it. They don't need to have sex. You don't need to have sex to have a great movie. Please do not put that in our movies. And if you are, make it rated R. I don't care if all it is is, is they're kissing and one guy takes off a shirt and, and the girl takes off a shirt. Or two girls take off a shirt. Two guys take off a shirt. I don't care. That should be rated R. Especially if there's a nine-year-old kid watching. Yeah, PG-13 doesn't mean PG-13 anymore. Nine-year-old kids watch that stuff. Did you know this? No. Uh, maybe the movie makers do. That's kind of terrifying. It's a, it almost looks like they market their movies for a PG-13 audience, but then give parts of the movie that a nine-year-old would want to watch, especially a nine-year-old in today's culture. And then they say, we're going to throw some sex in there. Yeah, that's not good. Not at all. Paths to exposure. Deliberate versus accidental. Young, po- young people can be exposed to pornographic material either deliberately or accidentally, and the distinction between these two paths is critical in understanding young people's encounters, especially with internet pornography. Hmm. Yes. The commercial hire or sale of X-rated movies to minors is probably rare, given the financial penalties for retailers and high political costs for pornography industry as a whole. On the internet, minors may search for sexually explicit material using a search engine or go to a particular website, ask in a chat room for sexually explicit materials, visit a chat room focused on sexual dialogue, or sign up to a mailing list which sends out sexually explicit images. Second, young people are exposed to pornography through accidental or inadvertent means. Okay, let's go back for a second. All that has to be done is Google sex, Google porn, 
and you're going to find websites filled to the brim with videos of, uh, of actors and, and people who have been abducted doing it. You don't, you don't need these, these chat rooms. How old is this paper? How old is this paper? Come on, paper. How old are you? Uh, 2007. I knew it. That doesn't mean none of this information is relevant. It just means the numbers have changed since then. Let's see. First, for free in large quantities, the internet is an ideal environment for pornography as it is an excellent medium for the storage, display, and transfer of images and text. Yes, they can easily access all of this despite geographic boundaries. Um, uh, the commercial online adult entertainment industry offers a very wide range of content. Uh, yes, they do. That's terrifying. Further non-commercial carriers include individuals sharing pictures online, bulletin boards, and news groups containing sexually explicit material, chat rooms, and instant messages involving cyber sex. Online dialogue centered on sexual interaction. Basically, they're role-playing sex. Personal profiles and web pages. It's terrifying. All right, here we go. Australian Australians youths exposed to pornography. All right. Uh, to what extent have, have children in Australia been exposed to pornography? To assess this, the Australia Institute commissioned a telephone survey for, from the market research company News Poll. This survey was conducted in September 2002 and included 200 respondents, 100 males and 100 females, aged 16 to 17 years. Youth younger than 16 could not be interviewed for ethical reasons. Yes, some tell me they were watching porn just as well. Uh, the survey restricted to Sydney and Melbourne, and the interviewers could be male or female. Throughout this discussion, the terms children and minors used interchangeably refer to all those under 18 years of age. Okay, but it makes it clear that these individuals are below the legal age for access to adult pornographic material. That is true. Participants were asked about the exposure to X-rated videos and sex sites on the on the internet. Some respondents may have reported exposure to videos and DVDs that are not in fact X-rated, but focused on sexually explicit content. Uh huh. So, similarly, some participants may have taken sex sites to refer to any website with sexually related content. Exposure to X-rated movies. Okay. Um. When asked whether watching X-rated movies is widespread among boys of their age, 5 out of 6 boys, 84%, and the same percentage of girls said that it is. Thus, watching pornographic videos is seen to be the common, if not normal, behavior among boys. When asked whether watching X-rated videos is widespread among girls, only 4% of girls agreed. Boys overestimate girls' use of pornography and that 15% of boys believe that watching X-rated videos is widespread among girls. You didn't give us numbers in the first place on how many girls watch this. Um... Mm. Among girls, only 11% report that they have watched an X-rated video, all of them less often than once every two or three months. The 15% of boys and 4% of girls who believe the watching X-rated videos is widespread among 16, 17 year girls are clearly wrong in their assessment. Just under three quarters, 73% of boys report that they have watched an X-rated video. One in 20 watch them on a weekly basis, while more than a fifth watch an X-rated video at least once a month. Huh, that's interesting. I, I wonder if that's changed. It, it has changed. You know what? It has changed in the past. Holy cow. 15 years? No. 14 years. Since this paper was published. This study suggests that one of that one in 10, 16 to 17 year olds who has ever seen an X-rated video, very few of them are regular consumers. Canadian research among teenagers with an average of 14, age of 14 gives a similar finding. While 90% of boys and 60% of girls had watched pornography, defined more broadly in the Canadian study, okay, one third of the boys, but only two percent of the girls, did at least once a month. Typically, girls watch pornography only once because their boyfriend or somebody wanted them to, or because they were curious and did not watch again. Similarly, a Swedish study found that thirty percent of adolescent boys and only three percent adolescent girls were watching pornography at least once a week. In short, people are watching a lot of porn. It's it's getting sooner and sooner in our kids' ages. Uh, they look for it specifically. Thirty-eight percent of of sixteen to seventeen-year-old boys. 16 to 17 year olds have searched the internet for sex sites. 22% access internet sites at least every two or three months. Among girls, only 2% they said they deliberately sought out internet sex sites. They have done so only very occasionally. The figure of 2% of girls who have deliberately sought out sex sites stands in stark contrast to the 60% of girls who had accidental exposure to explicit sex on the internet. Yeah, I'm not surprised by any of this. In international research, rates of deliberate consumption of internet pornography among youth or boys of a similar age vary from 15% to 25%. A UK-based study on 9 to 19-year-olds, 10% had visited a porno pornographic site on purpose, including 15% of 16 to 17-year-olds. And these numbers have changed. These numbers have changed. I want to go find just the numbers real fast. How much pornography are Americans consuming? Huh. 60-year-old men are only slightly... 
still only slightly less likely to have viewed pornography within the past week than men in their 20s and 30s, because the men in their 60s did not become exposed to pornography on the internet in their youth, unlike the 20-year-old and 30-year-old guys. Holy cow, it's about 40 to 50%, according to this chart. Percent viewing pornography within the past week by religious affiliation attend three plus times per month. That's how they dis- define religious affiliation. Evangelical Protestant, 29% to 4%. Okay, the 4% is the woman, 29% is the men. Pentecostal, 21% to 2%. Fundamental Protestant, I'm going guy first, girl second. Uh, 37% to uh, 19? That's a 1 to 1%. How? How a woman? I wonder what would happen if I went and looked for softcore instead. Like what the numbers would be. Liberal Protestant, 46%. Anybody surprised? Not me. To 8%. Uh, traditional Catholic, 21 to 3. Moderate Catholic, 26 to 6. 35 to 2 for li- liberal Catholic. Other Catholic, 26 to 18. Wow. Why 18% for other Catholic? LDS or Mormon, 14 to 3. Other Christian, 24 to 9. That is an incredible amount of porn being watched right there. Percentage use using porn past week by religious service attendance weekly twenty six to six percent occasionally thirty eight to nine percent never fifty three to twelve. Very clearly, religious affiliation has everything to do with how much sex you're watching on the internet. That is terrifying. Thirty four percent of men and seventy two percent of women report not viewing pornography in at least a year, if at all. Versus data reveal, the Relationships in America data reveal that 43% of men and 9% of women report watching pornography in the past week. Holy freaking cow, man. While 19% of women under the age of 30 report viewing pornography in the past week prior to the survey, only 3% of women in their 50s report doing so. Meaning that unlike men, the youngest women are over 6 times as likely to have viewed pornography recently as the oldest woman. Figure 10.1 shows that for men, pornography viewing peaks in their 20s and 30s before beginning to diminish slowly among older men in this sample. Nevertheless, six-year-old men are still only slightly less likely to have viewed pornography within the past week than men in their 20s and 30s. Because men have a sex drive. It's testosterone and our biology. It doesn't go away as we age unless we get castrated. So in short, this is very terrifying. The world we're living in is filled with freaking pornography, man. And no matter what we do, it's just getting worse and worse. So how do we stop this? How do we stop this? How do we stop kids from watching pornography at such a young age? Let's see what this says. This is a very brief paper. No, it's not. It's incredibly long. Ah! Let's see. There's all the results. In 2010, 13% of the youth of, of U.S. youth reported IPE, or intentional porn exposure, at least once in the past year. There was a modest increase in the percentage of youth that reported IPE between 2000 and 2010. 1.395% see okay that's a bunch of weird numbers virtually all the increase took place in the first 5 years the ipe increase was primarily driven by those aged 16 to 17 years old only 2% of youth ages 10 to 11 reported ipe in 2010 once again we are 11 years away from that increases were in ipe were ver- observed for white youth but not black or hispanic youth i wonder why uh, in stratified analysis increases in ipe from 2010 were observed 2000 2010 were observed for both boys and girls although very few girls reported ipe in short, girls don't watch porn anywhere near as much as guys watch porn. And guys are more interested in watching it on a regular basis because biology. We are designed to find a girl, a cute girl, and make her ours and impregnate her in further on her genes if you want to go from a purely animalistic standpoint. Which means, what does that mean? It means to do that, we have to be on the lookout for beautiful women. That, that's what we look for. Now, the, the definition of beautiful woman has changed over the centuries. It used to be if you were fat, uh, I'm, I mean, I mean plump, if you were plump, and if you were, uh, if you had rosy cheeks and you were plump, and you wore a dress down to your heels, a guy would find you attractive and would take you. Well, not literally take you, not like abduct you off the streets, although probably some would. Uh, he, um, but now the definition has changed to modern day America, you're skinny, you're fit, maybe you have abs, maybe you don't, you work out, you spend a lot of time outside, you're tan, you have blonde hair, blue eyes, I don't know if that's changed over the years, blonde hair, blue eyed, uh, maybe you have red hair, um, but in short, the, the standards for beauty have changed, and thus the standard for guys that they look for in a girl has changed, but if you look at the porn industry, 
It's a lot of fit girls, usually not heavy set. There are some, as that's been a growing, um, a growing thing in in woke America and woke uh, other parts of the world, where it's like, I, she's a fat woman. We gotta look at her with beauty, and and then they like, okay, well, I guess people want this now, so we're gonna put it into our, into our porn sites, which is disgusting to me because well, I just don't find that attractive. If you find that attractive, that's that's all cool for you. Um, but it's disgusting anyway. There should not be a market for women to sell their bodies. I mean, if you want to do that, I'm not going to stop you. Legally, I'm not going to stop you. But it should be so prevalent that 9-year-old kids can find it and 10-year-old kids can find it. There's got to be a way we can stop this. And at the very least, if you're a guy or a girl and you're like 16, 17, 18 years old and you're caught in the throes of this and you want to stop, I can tell you right now, the best thing you can do is talk to somebody. Talk to somebody you trust, who you know will not laugh at you for coming to them with your concerns. And when you do so, make it very clear that you want to quit. I know it sounds like quitting an addiction, because it is, but um, it helps. It really helps to have somebody you can talk to who can hold you accountable. Um, when you're quitting porn, it's essential that you replace pornography with other habits. Replace it with uh, hiking, with walking, with reading a book, with Make new relationships. You need to make new relationships. Replace it with... Don't replace it with food too much. It's not a bad thing if you learn how to cook and create great food. It is a bad thing if you turn to that to replace... It. Any Anything that you replace that takes another level of addiction is not good. Don't start smoking when you're quitting porn. That's not healthy. You shouldn't start smoking anyway, but that's a different story. Um, you gotta fill that void with something. And I know, as those stats show, that if you're religious, particularly Christian religious... You watch porn less. Why? Because we have morals and we know, hey, this is wrong. We shouldn't do it. And then we're convicted and we do everything in our power to stop. Now, I'm wondering how inaccurate that is because if you're a Christian, imagine saying yes. You could feel so much stigma against against yourself and like, oh no, the church is going to disown me. Okay, even if those numbers climb by 10% for everything, it's still far lower, I think, based... I'd have to go do research on that, wouldn't I? I all right, my, my theory is it's going to be far lower than uh, an atheist or someone who doesn't really have the Christian morals, the Dujeo Christian values. If someone doesn't have those values, it's odds are they watch porn with no problem. And that's also con- corresponds to what I heard from the uh, expert on, uh, the brain neurologist on uh, Michaela Peterson's podcast. Not that you should be taking the word of somebody else. You should do your own research on this. If you think porn has no problems, if you listen to this whole thing and you still think porn has no problems, so the fact that it is causing depression, uh, okay, there's a chance it's causing depression, and it's taking away from from the time people have to, to do other things. If you're spending a couple hours a week browsing porn, which a lot of kids are, a day. A day? Let's say five hours a week. That's a lot of time you could be doing something else. And it's the same with social media. Uh, if you're watching, if you're doing a lot of social media use, there's a lot of time you could be spent doing something else, like a hobby or reading or writing or getting to know your friends. And because of that, you're just scrolling. I'm just doing some pornography use based on the research I've seen. Leads to uh, an, an uptick in depression and anxiety in especially religious and conservative people. Especially after the, as they're trying to quit or after they failed. Or failed meaning they watched porn when they said they weren't going to watch it anymore. And it is addictive especially for young guys who are compelled to watch it. Uh, pornography uh, teaches one to be more aggressive in, in their sex and uh, more mm, more treating women like sex objects. And then, uh, yeah, so find a way to limit this stuff. Find something to talk to. Make sure you're open and honest with the people you care about who care about you. And then pick up hobbies and new relationships and get a job if you don't have one. Uh do what you got to do to make your life better. Um, as Jordan Peterson likes to say, don't do what you hate doing. That's not a life you want to live. So until next time, I want you all to keep going, keep learning, and I'll see you on the next Wandering Thoughts episode.